Fantastic. Well, hey, everybody. It's so exciting to be here. I've really enjoyed meeting you all through Facebook Lives and having what's so cool is I have some of the most wonderful, amazing friends that actually happen to be so well known in their field. And today is going to be such a treat for all of you listening because we have Susie Cohen, who not only is one of my dearest and best friends in the world, but is also a famous author, a pharmacist, um, as she is an entrepreneur. There's so many things you're going to learn about her today, and I'm excited to introduce her. Um, before we start, just be sure and uh, share with your friends, especially if they want to know more about vitamins and nutrients and all the kind of healthy things we can do to support our health and our bodies during this time. And then um, be sure and ask questions because I'll be out of the corner of my eye watching our feed as well and taking note of your questions. And if we can answer any of those live, we will do that. And you have Susie Cohen, uh, America's uh, pharmacist, um, most beloved and author. So she's here too. And I'm sure if you have questions for her, I will um, ask those as well. Um, just FYI on my side, if you need any information, you can find me at jillcarnahan.com. All right, Susie, let's jump in. I want to kind of introduce you. Um, you're a licensed pharmacist for 30 years and the author of Drug Muggers and so many other books. I'm sure in the back behind you, you have a slew of all the uh, famous books that you've written. Um, and I just am excited. People always know I love story. So I love to start with just even, I would like to go way back of how did you get into pharmacy school and how did that all happen in the very oh, beginning? Wow. That is going way back. Yeah. Well, first, let me just say um, thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be on your Facebook feed and with your audience. And I hope that today is not only inspirational, but entertaining and humorous. Um, there's so many stories I could tell, too. They would just love you even more than they already do. But um, I didn't really start out wanting to be a pharmacist. I wanted to be a medical researcher and work for a drug company and, you know, basically find a cure for for a disease or cancer, help people. And so I was always in help mode, but it wasn't always, you know, something where I wanted to dispense pills and dispense drug information. That sort of happened um, on a walk along the campus at the University of Florida where I was doing all my, my under, undergrad or, you know, the preliminary courses. And I was with a friend and he said, oh, I'm taking the PCAT in a couple of weeks. Do you want to do that? I said, what's the PCAT? He said, it's a test to get into pharmacy school. So, oh, okay. I love it. I mean, that sounds like fun. I wasn't expecting anything, but um, I went ahead and took the test, and so did he. We were just study friends, and we both got into pharmacy school, and four years later, we graduated, you know, like the next best nerd, knowing every medication and being able to pronounce all these multi-syllabic drug names yeah. and things like that. And I honestly thought that drugs were the answer to everyone's illness. I really thought with all my heart and soul that I was getting into this profession, into this industry, and it was to help people. Only about maybe five to 10 years in that I started to notice a trend at my retail pharmacy. I would dispense a medication, and then maybe an hour or two later, or a day or two later, you know, my next shift, like there was a time frame differed for everyone, but they would call and say something bad happened. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I have a stomach ache, I have a headache. This is supposed to knock me out. I've been sleeping for 14 hours, you know, or the spouse would call. And I started to realize like, wow, this, the drugs are not the be all end all. And it was compounded with another factor that I'll share. A lot of people don't know this about me, but um, I, I, mar I was married to my second husband at the time. His name is Sam. And he had um, been injured by an antibiotic for having taken it a long time. It's called getting floxed, mm -hmm. which if you want to get into that, we can. If not, people can Google it. But the point of the story is compounded with my feelings at work where I was seeing my patients get hurt from my medications. I was also seeing this at home where medications weren't helping him recover from the antibiotic toxicity that he had experienced. So it was this huge awakening where I thought, there has to be something better than patented medications out there. There has to be a way to help and heal people without hurting them, you know, especially watching Sam who had been hurt by this antibiotic, which is still prescribed today. And, and then, you know, in pharmacy school where we're taught that anything but patented synthetic medications are the answer, you know, that you can't mention something like echinacea, you'd be laughed out the door. 
So it, it was basically all of that that inspired me to start writing a newspaper column. <laughs> and then the, then the rest happened really quickly. Gosh, Susie, thanks for sharing because it is such an interesting thing about how our personal experiences and our passion, I'm no different with breast cancer and Crohn's and medical school and then realizing, gosh, there's got to be a different way. When my gastroenterologist told me, you know, you have Crohn's, you're going to need drugs or surgery for the rest of your life. You're going to need immune modulating agents. You're probably going to have multiple surgeries. You're probably going to have your colon removed and this is incurable. And then I he had the nerve. I said, you know, well, this diet, I was just a naive third year medical school student. I didn't know much. And I said, well, you know, doctor, does diet have anything to do with this? And he's like, no, Jill, diet has nothing to do with this. And you and I know, like, there's this intuitive sense of like, there's more, that's not true. And I didn't know a lot, but I remember thinking kind of similar to you, like, there's got to be more, that can't be true. And I'm stubborn. I've got German Swiss background. And I was like, gosh, darn it, I'm going to prove him wrong. And I fired him. And I was like, I'm going to check this diet stuff out. I came across specific carbohydrate diet. I implemented it. And Susie, you know, I wasn't cured in two weeks, but within two weeks, my fevers, my pain, my diarrhea, all the symptoms were gone just with the change in diet. So I yeah. knew there's something there to it. So I love how our stories are, they're different, but they're similar in the sense that we knew there was more, right? There was, there had right. to be more. The thing, so it's interesting you share that story. And I remember the specific carbohydrate diet. I even interviewed the lady before her passing. I forgot her name. Elaine Gottschall. Yes. Yeah, that's it. And, <laughs> and I bought like a 20 pound thing of almond flour and started making yogurt. And it is a remarkable diet. Like kudos to her for, you know, having created that and, and the, the offsprings of all of that. I'm curious for you though, were, were, did you, were you able at that Point where you were in the midst and in the throes of all of that, able to trace it back to your childhood or to, to the farm or to anything that you grew up with around it? Or at that time, you just were, it was survival mode. Oh gosh, that's such a great question. So insightful. You are like a functional detective at heart, just like me, Susie. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, I'm curious because you, you're so um, articulate, you're so aware and intuitive. And I wondered if at the time, because a lot of people are dealing with something and I know when I've seen it over the years with Sam or even with my own health issues, I had thyroid disease for a, a period of probably a year, which I cured myself because like you, I am stubborn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to do this. Um, but, it, it, and I wondered if how, you know, if you were aware at that time or was it just, you know, dig your feet into the ground and, and survive and then look back. Yeah, no, I knew. I mean, I had already had introduction to root cause and functional medicine, although I wasn't a functional medicine practitioner. I was just in medical school. And I knew, you know, before medical school, I knew I wanted to do holistic healing and help people find wellness, not just with drugs and surgery. But I, I felt like the best route was the allopathic route because our system, unfortunately, is still driven by reimbursement and all the things that are driven by the conventional system. And if you had a heart attack or you had a car accident, the best place you want to be is in a conventional ER to get taken care of. But what they don't deal well with is gut issues, autoimmunity, all the things you and I see. And in my history, there's no doubt that I was um, definitely exposed to atrazine and organophosphates and pesticides, probably not only growing up on the farm, but even in utero or a preconception through my mother. Um, I think it was that far back. And then I got breast cancer at 25. And I think what happened was I was undiagnosed celiac. I didn't know it, but I actually had celiac disease. And I was like a carbitarian. So I was on a high carb diet for full of gluten. I actually was a vegetarian from age 14 to 25 when I got my cancer. And I have no problem if a vegetarian is healthy and knows how to do it right. I didn't. But at that time, I joke, it almost killed me, like not eating the right foods. And so that um, perfect storm of gluten without me knowing it being kryptonite to my system. And then the chemotherapeutic agents that I had, uh, cytoxin, uh, 5-FU, and doxyrubicin, those are all very toxic to the gut lining. And cytoxin actually has studies in animals that show it creates a permeability in the gut. So it was a perfect storm to go flooding in garbage from inside the lumen of the gut into my immune system and creating an inflammatory response. And then I have this gene called NOD. And this NOD gene is related to Crohn's disease risk. And what it means is genetically, when I see normal bacteria that get into the immune system and into the bloodstream, my body reacts extra um, quick and extra aggressively towards those bacteria and causes collateral damage. So between the toxic exposure, the chemotherapy, um, the gluten that I didn't know was toxic, I think all of those things created a massive permeable gut on top of a genetic predisposition towards right. and then that's right. what happened.
that is what they call the perfect storm. You yeah. have your environmental and genetic. And so it's a lot of people that could benefit from, I could see your next article, yeah. <laughs> your next blog. <laughs> well, speaking of blogs and articles, you've been a prolific writer. In that way, you're one of my heroes because you just keep putting stuff out. The other day I asked you, because some people know I just got a, a, a deal on a publishing deal. So next fall will be my first book coming out. Um, oh, but you so and my wife are a pro. And so I asked you the other day, how do you, how do you get inspired over and over again? And, but let's go back to how did you start? How, what's the story of your first book? <laughs> um, congratulations, by the way, on the book deal. I, I definitely need to hear more. I'm so proud of you, like everything you've done and to have this as another accolade, it's going to just be amazing. Um, so how did I start blogging? I got mad. <laughs> I, I love it. I got mad and you know, anger is a motivator just like love and just like fear. But I got mad because the medications, they scared me. They were hurting my patients. They hurt my husband. I got ticked off. And, you know, so I went, so I started immersing myself in natural holistic medicine. And I went to a newspaper that was local and I was excited. I put on my best dress and heels and a pound of makeup and everything. <laughs> and I brought a sample article and they said, no. So, um, so I went to another newspaper because I'm like, oh, he must have had a bad burrito. So <laughs> Ocala was where I was, um, by the way. Um, people in Ocala who are listening, I have a strong fan base there because I did wind up in that paper. They might know me by my maiden name, which was Susie Gervich. Um, wow. Yeah, and my parents are the ice cream man and the ice cream lady, and they just retired last year. But anyway, they lived in Ocala for got over 40 years. Wow. And so I, so anyway, the point of this is that um, I got mad. I went to another local paper. I finally went to the Lake City Reporter after two years of trying and having 30 um, letters from the Chicago Tribune, the Seattle Times, the Sacramento Bee, the Orlando Sentinel, the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel, and like 25 other papers stuck to my wall saying, no, 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 we're not interested in this. And the Lake City Reporter, which was about 30 miles north of Ocala, said no. And I was in his office. And I think that was pivotal for me. His name was David Brown. I still love this guy. He gave me my break. He just looked at me because he said no, and I just sat there and stubborn, right? I love it. <laughs> You're and I just hero. like this, and I, there must have been some type of facial expression. And there was this awkward silence between us and a little bit of a stare down that was pleasant. I mean, I just had big eyes because I was confused as to why he was saying no to me. Finally, after about 30, 45 seconds, which is uncomfortable, he goes, why do you want this so much? Why do you, why do you want to do this? And I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was pretty empathic in that I just want to help people. What I have to give is a gift to people. What I have to share can change people's lives. You don't understand what I've been through. Everything I've learned can help people. And if you don't put me in your paper, someone else will. And another awkward silence. And he goes, you can start Tuesday. I love it. Oh my gosh, that stubbornness. That good that did it. Either that or the great shoes. I it might have been the shoes, you know. It's, it might have been. So but so then this was ten thousand circulation. I don't know what portion of those people read in Lake City, but it was a ten thousand circulation. And within a year I was up to about two million in circulation. And within five years, every single newspaper that said no yeah. was carrying me. Wow. And I took it as such an honor that they dubbed me as the Dear Abby of Health. And I was getting more mail um, in some markets and some newspapers than, you know, than yeah. she was in, in a couple of markets like wow. Orlando. Yeah. And, you know, that's how fast it grew. So I became a syndicated columnist. And this might be an interesting story, but I was um, syndicated by the Chicago Tribune at one point. I signed a deal so that they could syndicate me. And they got upset with one of my articles that I wrote, and it's been about 15 years, and the article that I wrote was warning women that, certain women, that a mammogram could be harmful mm -hmm. if they did it repeatedly because of the radiation, and that as an adjunctive to start using this new thing called digital thermography, well, one of their advertisers pulled out on them, or maybe he didn't pull out, but he 
called them and ranted and down came the ax for me. They're like, get that columnist out of our paper. She's promoting digital thermography. Wow. Um, tell people, right? What, do, what, do you, what has come to be, <laughs> right? With yes, digital thermography is a great screening tool for young women to see about um, changes in the molecular patterns at the cellular level in breast tissue and actually your entire body. But you can see changes metabolically with the cells. Very and you can really. see them very quickly. And it's not that I'm not saying that mammograms should go out the door. Mm -hmm. All I was saying was to look at this as well yeah. for an adjunctive imagery. And, it, and, and today we know that the radiation that's emitted from those things can be in some cases harmful and can contribute to the formation of breast cancer depending on the individual. I, I'm parsing my words because there is a place for everything. Yeah. I'm not saying no to them. I was just, I think I just got upset in the Chicago Tribune cut me from, and I was their biggest, most popular columnist in their Sunday Q section wow. at the time. Wow, Susie, but that's part of our journey is like speaking truth sometimes comes up against adversar adversaries and people who are out for money. And I mean, you and I, the heart is truly to help people. That's really why we do what we do. We have both said to each other, we would probably do the same thing if we weren't paid a penny because we're still making a difference. Now, thank goodness that we can pay our bills with what we do too, but it really is a passion for us. I love that you mentioned mammogram too, because here I am a breast cancer survivor. I had breast cancer at 25 years old. That's incredibly young. Were I to get mammograms every year from 25 to 60, that's a heck of a lot of radiation and that actually increases my risk of cancer. So even though it's recommended, I have not gotten a yearly mammogram because that's so much radiation over those years. So you really have to think again, be very, I'll be very clear. I am not against mammograms. I recommend them. I order them for most, if not all of my female patients. But what we decide together is where is that limit of amount of exposure? When do you start getting them? How frequently do you get them? And there's no one size fits all. So this is a discussion between myself and the patient and deciding what risks they're willing to take and all of those factors play into what kind of family history. And certainly if you're high risk, um, it is not a problem to get an annual mammogram, but that would be reserved for the highest risk, the lowest period of time. All of those things take are taken into account. And it's important because um, any procedure, any sort of screening has risk and benefits. And some people don't talk about the risk, they only talk about the benefit. Exactly. And what you just said was the basic meat of what I wrote about in that article. And I'm sure that that, that was my last article because they, they didn't want to lose their advertiser. But I'm sure I saved a lot of women some grief and saved you know, their health and their body. So yeah. it was worth it. No other paper cut me. In fact, I got mad again. And you know, I bought back my syndication rights. I thought if you won't print the truth, and you're going to cut if yeah. this is what it takes. I paid them off thousands of dollars to buy back my syndication rights. Wow. And I've been self syndicated the whole time and I took it and it just blew up. I, at some point, at one point I had 20 million in circulation. Wow. Again, I don't know what number of people read that, but you know, because some people read the newspaper very, some people today don't know what the newspaper is, but <laughs> back then it was a thing people would read the paper and they would, you know, read the columnists and, things like that. So, Oh, I know my parents are probably like your parents, but they like, Oh, we love Susie. We, and they live in Florida half the year. So they're, we read every, every uh, week and then they love you and they adore you. And um, speaking of your parents are so precious. I know we've talked off and on about them. So I didn't know they were the ice cream man and, and the ice cream lady. Yeah. But I just adore, I haven't ever met them. I've just seen photos and videos and your stories um, what do you think is some of the, the qualities that your parents like gave you as far as your drive? And what do you see as some things that your parents have been influential in your life? Because you are so successful and driven and you've got these delightful, beautiful parents. They're just so sweet. I, they are I, cute. I love my mom and dad so much. I'm so blessed to have them um, at this point. Dad's in his 90s, mom's in her uh -huh. 80s. Um, so they're immigrants. Uh -huh. So they, uh, they, they both multilingual can speak various different languages. They immigrated with my two older brothers. So two children, they came to New York City, they learned the language, they, they were pregnant, she, pregnant with me. And so I was born in 1965. And, um, and, and at that time, they were still learning to speak English. They speak English fluently now, but it's a little bit, you know, they have their own little special dialect. Yeah. And they, they immigrated at the time from Israel. 
So I'm a bit of a mutt because my mom has French and Polish in her and my dad has Russian in him. And, but anyway, they met in Israel. They fell in love there. They had two boys. They immigrated to New York City and had me. So by the time I was like seven or eight years old, my parents got a phone call and it was the teacher saying, we think your daughter has a speech impediment and we'd like to enroll her in some speech therapy and some classes and we'll try to fix this. And so try speaking to my mom who has new English, but has French and Polish background. That's, her, you know, her French yeah. is her native tongue. She was born in Paris. Mm -hmm. it, finally, they're like, could you, could you put her father on the phone. So they put my dad on the phone. That was no better. And then <laughs> they explained to them, you know, the, my heritage, my ancestry. And it was like, you know what? We got this. We'll teach her to speak English. There's no problems with your daughter. <laughs> and here I am today, you know, decades later, I speak English fluently. Yes, <laughs> all over. My oh. audience. <laughs> right. That is, oh, I love it. I love but, it. Because I was a mutt, you know, the yeah. words weren't coming out correctly because at home they were speaking all these different languages. So I was going to school speaking all this. A little stuff. bit of other words coming in there. Now, do you currently, are you fluent in other languages? I, I didn't, I don't know if I even know that about you, Susie. Is there other So language? I can, I can understand Hebrew pretty well. I used to be able to speak it a little bit. My mom said till I was about seven, I could speak French. Yeah. Um, maybe three words in Yiddish. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but no, I, I tried to speak Spanish. I took some classes, but I was never very good at it. I wish I was. Um, uh, well, you're very fluent in English in every written, uh, verbal, and other ways. I, I'm fluent in English <laughs> and fluent in DoorDash. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. The other language. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, what about your book? So that, that was your column, and that set you up. But then what happened with your first book? So my first book, uh, that was The 24-Hour Pharmacist, which was originally named Sex, Chocolate, and Botox. And oh, <laughs> I love it. They changed it to The 24-Hour Pharmacist because I'm oh, a pharmacist. I much prefer the first title. <laughs> I know. It probably would have been an NYT bestseller, but be that as it may, um, they changed the name to The 24-Hour Pharmacist, which they felt excuse me, they felt was in keeping with, you know, you have this handbook and it was a, a guidebook with natural holistic tips and alternatives to drugs. And I, it would be like your 24 seven pharmacist guidebook. Oh. Um, and then after that was an, another book that I think uh, actually went farther is the drug muggers book, which is now in probably 10 languages. So I'm really proud of that. And that's about drug nutrient depletion. Um, and I had read a, uh, a handbook at the time right before that by two authors Ross Pelton and uh, James I forgot his name, pharmacist uh -huh. oh, the great guys little handbook and they had done this work on drug nutrient depletion well I interpreted that and added more data to it and created a, a, a book for consumers that was palatable to regular people who were taking medications and it was about drug nutrient depletions and I couldn't think of a good title so I went over to Sam who was in the living room one night and I said, I need to encapsulate how to name this book aptly so that it's consumer friendly and I'm really having a hard time. So he was playing around with different names and we could, he's like drug nutrient depletions. We couldn't think of anything good. And then at some point I gave him a slice of banana chocolate bread and he just like, I don't know, it was a moment of idiocy or brilliance. I don't know which, but he just, props up on the couch. He goes, drug muggers. <laughs> wow. So I submitted the book with that title on and uh, they didn't want to publish it. So I got another no. So I said, why? Like what, why? 24 hour pharmacist has done great. We even put it in hardback. We went from paperback to hardback. Wow. And <clears throat> they said they didn't want to offend doctors. Oh. Well, wow. 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 <laughs> so you know what I did? We, we published it ourselves. I took what little savings I had, um, cause times were tough back then. I had little kids and you know, Sam wasn't feeling well. He's working part-time. I was working part-time. I had other issues, um, lawsuits from the ex issues. I had issues, right. And expenses. So I published this book. I printed 1000 copies from, sold it from the back of my trunk. Yeah. And then I got a call or an e maybe it was a phone call or 
I got contacted by the producers of Dr. Oz's radio show. They loved the concept and they wanted me on the program. So I flew up north and I met Dr. Oz and I did his radio show. And it was really like one of the first big breaks that I actually had. He, he took me in a, a, like a pet project, if you will, because here's this pharmacist. She's a bit of a rebel. She's a bit of a bad bleep. <laughs> and she's trying to get the word out there to keep consumers safe. Yeah. And she's just showing them that medications should be married with a nutrient. Yeah. I wasn't telling anybody to stop their drug. I was just telling right. them if you take a statin cholesterol drug, take CoQ10. If you take birth control, take selenium and B12. This, this wasn't rocket science to me. And my heart was in the right place. And he saw that. And after that, I got on his program. And then, then I get a call from my publishers. And they're like, could you send us a copy of that book? Wow. <laughs> I'm like, oh, now you want to see it? it? Yeah. Now they wanted to see it, and, and they gave me an answer within a week. They said, we, we'll publish this now. We, we get it now. Wow. It's almost like every step of the way, Susie, you encountered this, but like you did not take no for an answer. I love that. No. If I hear no, I just need to re-ask the question a different way or ask somebody else. There is no such thing as no. That and I think that's a take-home point for patients. Mm -hmm. if, if they think they can heal and they think that they're – they're not doing well in the care that they have, they need to come to you. But the, <laughs> but the point is, is they need to go somewhere else to find out what else can be done. Yeah, totally agree. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many questions I want to ask you. I want to talk about your, your recent, like last several years and all of your um, development of vitamins and stuff. But before I do, I know people are like, well, how do you guys know each other? And, you know, I want to go back to, remember when we first met, I think it was almost yeah. 10 years ago and yeah. um, we didn't even know it. We lived like in the same building, like a few floors down from each other um, at one time, right? Uh, without, yeah, it's crazy. You, you lived one floor down from me and I was so happy to meet you. So I had just moved here with my husband, maybe the, the year before, and we moved here. It was the weirdest thing. We flew out here so I could give a lecture at a weight loss clinic and we never took our flight home. We moved into an apartment with our travel suitcase and, and just, you know, started buying Tupperware and I think I stole a lemon or a thing for <laughs> Papa John's or whatever they <laughs> struck forks. I don't know. <laughs> but we moved here with pretty much nothing. And we made a phone call and told the neighbor to put a for sale sign in our house. So wow. we just moved here. So I was really hungry for um, functional medicine expert because I had been, you know, studying functional medicine when Jeffrey Bland had seven people in the room. Yeah. yeah. And I saw that you were speaking somewhere. So I went to your venue and I don't know if you remember this, but I went to your venue and I was in the audience and afterwards I went up to you and said how great you were, how smart you were. And, you know, could we stay in touch? And I think we exchanged emails or something. Yeah. I remember and like, who is this? But it was, you know, there's just people, certain people in your life. I remember the moment and it's just like, I loved you instantly. Like, I'm like, who is this woman? She's really cool. And I know I just kind of knew we'd be friends. I'm sure you, this is a very special connection. And, um, and it's so funny because that was like, I remember when first starting my practice, little um, one room that I shared with Dr. Bob Roundtree, I had, you know, one day a week and I was hardly any patients and, um, then I remember doing these like free lectures in the community. And I think maybe 12 people showed up, maybe 10, maybe less. I mean, it was nowadays it's a whole different ball game, but it's so interesting to go back to our roots and just humbly remember all the things that have happened, the miracles really. And, and even meeting you because I count you as one of my dearest friends. And it's so rare in this realm to have women who are not only passionate about healing and helping people at the root and not just out for money. Like really we are, our hearts are in the right place, but also, um, trying to find answers and trying to seek solutions and a little stubborn. And then we love shoes so that we can have all kinds of discussions about fashionable shoes and free bird sales. I always get a text from your husband, Jill, the free birds are on sale. Please go now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll run to the mall, like no matter what I'm doing, drop everything. Free birds are 80% off. And so you can see, you know my collection out there, right? I'm a total boot addict. <laughs> yeah. And you look good. You can rock those boots, baby. You look so good in them. 
<laughs> my fetish was high heels for a long time and then um you, you can wear those in florida at certain venues and when you go out but i was when we moved here i was wearing them around the streets of boulder and i looked like maybe i was working the streets or something <laughs> at some point I, or maybe like peg bundy you know with the <laughs> <laughs> the thin legs and then the high heels and mine were like three to four inches and I could walk in them pretty well <laughs> and I had decades of training in Florida and at some point I retired them they're in the garage <laughs> write to me I will send you pictures you can have them <laughs> I love it you're right like I was in Chicago for years too and it's like black suits and you know high heels and then I get to Boulder I'm like oh my people I can put on like hippie shirts and cut off jean shorts and my cowboy hat and boots and I fit right in and I feel much more yeah. at home I'm only out of the, my pajamas because you said I was going to be on Facebook Live. Normally, I would be in like flannels or something. I'm I fine. know, I know. I had a, oh, Susie, it's so fun to talk to you. Um, so let's talk about, I know people want to hear about what you've been up to in the last several years. And I'm so um, proud of you and excited um, to share with people some of the solutions that you have. Because you've actually not only, you've written, you were syndicated for so many years, millions of uh, people uh, reading your column every week, and then you go on to be a famous author, but you didn't stop there because you've developed some products. Um, and I remember the very beginning sitting in a coffee shop and you're like, what do you think about this formula? Would this be good? And you've been so successful now. So tell, tell everybody a little bit about what you've been doing, some of your formulas and some of the solutions that you have um, created um, and they're brilliant. Okay, I'll try. Um, I'll try to nutshell it for you because it's it's kind of a long story. But basically, I was sending people all over to natural health food stores, which I still do. Mm -hmm. But there were there were times where they really couldn't get what they needed. And and I know you carry specialty form formulas, so it was a slow metamorphosis where I realized. I was sending people to the health food store and I knew they weren't able to buy the things that I was telling them, or maybe I had told them like six or seven things and it was going to break the bank for them to get everything. So, I, but I didn't really want to formulate because as a syndicated columnist and newspaper person and a blogger, you know, you, you don't usually have a thing to sell other than your book. So it was a real shift for me, but I got so many emails and, and there were letters and my friends would say, please, like, get yeah. over yourself, like, make us something. So when I hosted the Thyroid Summit in 2014, actually co-host with Dr. David Brownstein, um, that was a real awakening for me because I realized some of the things that I had taken to cure myself of hypothyroidism was really useful to other people and i created thyroid script and that was my first supplement and i ordered a thousand what i didn't expect was like to sell them in a week wow. <laughs> i thought that would last me two years so that like was a theme with your books and your products you're like ah, oh, and then everybody's like please then give us more we love Susie. <laughs> yeah and it wasn't even after during the thyroid summit it, it was probably six to eight months after the summit had aired so it really showed me people do want my products they are interested in that and i have a natural skill set because i understand pharmaceuticals and pharmacology and I understand med medical things. You know, I've had a lot of training in six years of school and 30 years of holistic. So when you put that together, you get supplements that are aimed and targeted. Like I can't name a medication that, that this could replace as an example, but, uh, and this is on my desk not to be promotional because it just got patented today. I saw that. I actually, put it on like, this is so exciting. So four, so this is actually, I want to make sure everybody hears that. Four patents you own, Susie. Four patent. Do you, it's patent. so, so hard to get a dietary supplement to be patented. But remember, I come from the pharmaceutical world. In my world, as a pharmacist, every drug is patented. That, so to me, that's an act, that's a thing. So but supplements aren't generally patented. They have to be unique enough for, for you to argue with the examiner, the auditor, whatever they are, the, the FDA people and the patent people to get it patented. So these things have to be unique enough and they are, but that's what happens when you cross a pharmacist with herbs. <laughs> you get four patents and you get supplements that work uh, without side effects. Yeah, and I'll be sure and share on this link to all your products, but go through, um, and if you have them handy, if you don't, just tell us about what ones do you have out? Because you have the thyroid script, the memory script, what else do you have? And then I want to be sure and talk about the immune script. <laughs> but what, oh, else, yeah. what are we your products? With, we can start with immune script. So, so this is really interesting. 
Um, there's not a lot that I can say because the FDA will throw me into a ditch. Um, so I just have to just hold it up and just say, this works. This can protect you. And the ingredients in it include andrographis, um, olive leaf extract, and there's Epicor for gut health. That's a trademark patented prebiotic type of dried fermentate. Um, it, and everybody knows olive leaf extract is it ha what it does. I can't say these things because, again, I, the FDA keeps a muzzle on supplement sellers. But, the, but this is a product that you can feel good about. And when you can't wash your hands fast and furious enough, you can take one immune script at night or two, and it'll help you sleep and it'll help you feel, you know, like a little bit of an insurance policy, if, especially if you're going out and about the town. Um, and then I have the uh, memory script, which is great for those bouts of forgetfulness. So it'll reduce forgetfulness. Uh, again, I can't name diseases. Joint script is, um, Joint script is kind of amazing. People love that. And then I have hashy script, which people think because I'm from Colorado that it has hash in it. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> we, we get that question. That is funny. And they don't realize no, Hashimoto's. Now, probably most of our listeners know what Hashimoto's is, but why don't you just explain in case there's someone who's listening who doesn't know about Hashimoto's? So a disclaimer coming now. Um, hashy script does not treat, cure, prevent, uh, Hashimoto's. It is not intended for the use of Hashimoto's. HashiScript supports immune health and thyroid structure and function. <laughs> there, now I've got that out of the way. Love it, love it. Love it. Um, so Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease, which many people require the use of medications. And I know you treat this in your practice all day long. Um, but what you can do is you can cut down on some of the proteins and the, the antigens that make it through the permeable intestinal mm -hmm. barrier, and it's the gut permeability that oftentimes will lead to uh, autoimmune illness. Not always, but oftentimes. And so Hashi script contains a digestive blend that cuts down on casein and gluten. Mm -hmm. um, it sort of attacks it and breaks it down so that maybe your body takes a, a less of a hit. Mm -hmm. And when you can cut down on those antigens, as you know, the immune response is lessened. And so that's kind of what it does. It also contains sel selenium, which supports thyroid hormone function and production. I gotta be careful. <laughs> So, no, I actually love that people are hearing this, Susie, because they 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 understand. And yet, there's also this. Um, you've dealt with this because you are developing your own scripts. You are being extremely abiding by the law, doing the right thing, creating great great products for people that would actually you, they feel better. I mean, that's the bottom line. They feel better when they take your. Look product. better. Yeah, they look better. They feel better. The college of beauty powder is one of our top sellers. Yeah, it's and we've been talking. Yeah. Oh, I want to. So let's talk about that real quick, and then I'll come back to the, my rant on the on the guidelines. What I was going to say is, you have been in this industry. You know, you know how how we can say things and how we can promote things that are helpful without um, stepping on any toes. Um, and a lot of us in functional medicine have more recently with um, all that's happening in the pandemic. There is a lot of crackdown because they do not want the information about alternatives to be out there. The bottom line is they, they want medications that are powerful and expensive and um, options that bring in billions of dollars to be the primary solutions, even if there's no solutions. And the truth is you and I have solutions. We have things that can help people. We have things that can actually support their function and support their yeah. immune system. But it's getting harder and harder to say that, which is so sad for me. And I know That's you and I have the same, me. like, don't take any no, right? Like I'm more and more... Um, I am more convinced that my voice is very important and I'm being cautious and doing the right thing like you are, but I'm not going to back down. People need to hear the important things that we're telling and then we're sharing. So I love that um, we actually, uh, that how you stated that because people get the idea that this is really important. It's important. It's important for our health and um, people want answers. They want solutions. Yeah, when you hear the FDA has come come knocking on your door, like you see that a lot of doctors, some of them doing ozone and, and other things, like to me that just means you have arrived. <laughs> you are doing something right <laughs> because they don't want you to be treating people um, with things that aren't um, 
lucrative for them. But you know, people are smart. It's not like it used to be. We have the internet now with different platforms available and a lot of health bloggers and medical physicians such as yourself, pharmacists, people who are talking and doing their part and getting the word out. And consumers aren't dumb. This is very transparent to them. And people are looking and what I've taken to doing is pointing people to studies so that I don't have to say it, but you can Google a, a Bangkok study on Andrographis and hopefully people would do that when they um, hang up or I don't know. I don't do a lot of social media. When they hang up from Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> I understand completely. <laughs> they, they got it. <laughs> well, so you're too young, but I'm 55, I think. And we used to have a phone with a little cord and you would hang up. <laughs> yeah, I remember the day. I totally get, I totally get you. <laughs> so when people hang up from a Facebook or a book phase, like my mother would say, they can Google the study on Andrographis. And then there's another amazing study on, on Skullcap. And a quick Google search will reveal which countries are using this and, and their case rate, as well as their mortality rate. And so I, I find those things interesting. And that's what I've taken to doing rather than me saying something and trying to parse my words and, and, and talk through a muzzle. I just point people to a study. Hey, look at that. I love it, Susie. I think I'm going to take some lessons from you because I, like I said, I feel more and more like I'm called for this. I want to give people good information. And I know my heart is aligned with integrity. I know that I'm not afraid that I'm doing anything wrong but i also know that the powers that be don't want that information out and so i have to be more careful than ever and you've practiced this for years because you've gotten great information great products out to the public and yet navigated these crazy waters tell us about the collagen we kind of passed right over that but i want people to know about the collagen product that you have too because i love collagen for skin yeah I think one of my best beauty secrets is collagen yeah and you're so pretty you look so great your skin looks fabulous and you're just glowing um so collagen wasn't on my radar until a few years ago and then I started researching it because I wanted because I'm getting older and I'm still in the media and I, I'm a little needle shy like I don't know I, I've tried Botox before but I'm a little nervous and it gets expensive and I don't know I get I get a little nervous with anything unnatural so the idea of putting botulinum into me makes me a little nervous. But but that said, there's no judgment. I've done it before, like years ago. So I started looking at the collagen and I would buy some and then they would smell like fish. <laughs> and so I learned that they can be, especially in some of the countries in Asia, that marine derived, fish scale derived collagen is a big thing, really a big thing. It's in a lot of K-beauty products and a lot of other products that are keeping women looking gorgeous and their skin is so gorgeous and porcelain. But I rejected that. So I found collagen, it's a brand name it's called the barisol it comes from new zealand the grass fed all of that Ooh, the best and stuff comes from new zealand the, the best, i love I, I dream to go and i imported this and i used varisol collagen which have clinical studies behind it along with tart cherry extract which is well known for supporting joint health structure and function <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and some vitamin C to push it into the cell. Anyway, it's a little tiny scoop because it's very concentrated and you take one scoop a day and you can have gorgeous looking skin without having to do a lot of stuff. And I really like that product. It's one of my best sellers. So it's called okay. Collagen Beauty Powder and I can send people a free sample. We can send them to your site and they can get stick packs or whatever you want to do. Oh, I'll just be sure and put a link here to your site. And I, I love the collagen. I think um, that's literally been one of my best kept beauty secrets is I take it every day. I really, really love love that. And I love that you mentioned the clean source because the sourcing is really important. And I've had those products that taste like fish. And it's like, especially I sometimes will put in coffee and fish and coffee, they just don't go together very well. It doesn't go together. And then there's, I'm glad you brought that up because you made me think of something. So there's certain collagen brands that have all a wide variety of the types of collagen, which I think is good if you want a head to toe type of collagen. That's not what I'm selling. I'm not dissing it or dismissing it either. But if you're just targeting your hair, your skin your nails mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and you just want a beauty collagen with a little extra oomph for your skin antioxidant health um, the collagen beauty powder is really remarkable because it's a tiny little scoop it's pink which women love it's pink from the natural cherry extract it's unflavored you can put it in anything and I think I'm starting to sound like I'm selling it which I'm not I just love you know when you formulate something you just it's like a baby these are like my babies yeah. they're 
And I have I three other the hours you spent with, with once in a while with me with coffee shops and, and on with experts that, you know, checking this ingredient, where does it come from? You really do your homework. And that's what I love that you bring to people, whether it's your books, your column, you do your homework. And the other thing I know people love about you is you're so real. I mean, that's what part of our friendship is just being real and authentic with one another. But a lot of your experience comes from um, your life and your experience with patients and experience with family members doesn't a lot of our um, drive to help, it just comes from those life things where like, here's a problem. I don't know the answer, but I'm going to find it out. See if I can find a solution. Yeah. I think it, love will drive you to, to do a lot of things. And I so deeply love my sweet Sam. Yeah. Um, he's clunky with moths. He is not the moth ninja. <laughs> I can cup them and get them out. So we're having a marital situation with the moths. So I think I'm going to write about that next Tell week. Tell me more. I want to know. <laughs> you have moth infestation in your home right now? Okay, we can be tangential. So, yeah, so in Colorado, in eastern Colorado and, and western Kansas, there's the Miller moth. It, it's like they swarm over Colorado. It, there's a migration and they go westward. And no lie, there's probably 20 in the house. And I don't want to kill something just because it got lost or it smells my. <laughs> peach crumble or something. So I'll, I mean, they're moths. They're like less attractive butterflies. These things aren't going to bite you. I mean, if it was a wasp, it, you know, that would be yeah. it, but it's a moth. It's kind of cute. So I'll get a cup and then a piece of paper, you know, under the cup. I don't have one to show you. I'm just, yeah. You can cup them and get them out yeah. and be free. Well, yeah. he, this is too much work for him. So he literally has this long stick that he grabs things it's like so you can, he doesn't have to bend down one of those grabbers which imagine grabbing lint from behind your washer it's one of those grabbers yep so it's on a pole it's two feet or three feet long it has claws he grabs a moth by the claw oh. and he walks he's like i'm gonna set it free this way because he didn't want to touch it yeah <laughs> oh, <laughs> and it flies so away <laughs> And he starts screaming like a girl. <laughs> but we have an agreement. Yeah. Sam and I have an agreement. This is no lie. We've been married over to, we got married in July of 1998. And we have an agreement. We got married in Florida. He would kill all of the cockroaches and spiders. He's good with a broom. Uh -huh. And I would be responsible for mice and snakes. We agreed to this before getting married. It's very serious. There have been some tense stares over the years, but he has accomplished his husbandly duties with an A+. Plus. But the moths were never discussed. Oh, no. It, so now it's up for grabs. Who gets so it? It's my job now. Oh, no. Oh, oh, that is hysterical. I would like to uh, have a GoPro on your head in your house sometime and see the moth um, saga unfold. <laughs> Please text him it, it, when you hang up from Facebook yeah. and tell him to do his husbandly duties and get the moths. I'm on it. Properly. I'm I am on it. <laughs> well, he threatened me. He held up a fly swatter. He's like, I got this. I'm like, no, you're no. not the moth player. <laughs> oh gosh oh this has been so fun Susie Cohen I knew it would be because we always have fun and um, people get a little insight into our weird sense of humor and our our obsession with free birds and and all of that stuff but it is so yeah, fun to talk about to you. your book I need a minute of your book tell me about your book what's it gonna be about yeah, well, thank you for asking. You know, it's funny because I'm, you know, kind of the mold expert. I thought it would be on, on environmental toxicity and mold because I've been through a lot and a lot of environmental chemicals from birth on have affected my health. But as I sat down to write the proposal this fall, and for me with the first book, I put a lot of work into the proposal. Um, sometimes you just have an outline. For me, it was four months of a basic mini book, right? So in this proposal, I started writing and I started writing about environmental toxicity. And I kept waking up almost awake from a dead sleep hearing the word memoir, like your story, your story. And I fought it because I was like, my story isn't worth telling. Like, who am I to tell my story? I'm not famous. I'm not. Um, are good. <laughs> but as I kept waking up and my soul was telling me, you need to tell your story. 
And so I shifted at two months into it, I shifted and I really shifted into what they call a prescriptive memoir. And so it's going to be about my life's journey and health. And in that will be weaved in the science and the faith and all those pieces of like, why did uh, atrazine affect my breast? So you'll actually know the chemical pathway a little bit about why that, but the real heart of it is my story. So I'm, I'm so excited um, and so terrified, um, but I'm also excited because I feel like whenever you go through suffering, we've both been through very difficult situations in our lives, but when you go through suffering and then somehow you can write and have purpose and meaning and share and inspire with the world, it actually gives meaning to all the stuff you've been through. So in that way, I'm kind of excited now to actually, as I write about it, it gives more meaning and purpose to the difficult things like cancer and Crohn's and mold and divorce and, uh, traumatic relationships uh, that I've been through because what I can do is take that and hopefully inspire and reflect to the reader the situations in their own life where they might be struggling and just encourage them. That's my goal. That's so beautiful, Jill. And, you know, I know you like, like no other, and I just want to tell you your path to recovery and your vibrance and your brilliance. The story does need to be shared. Don't be afraid. If you ever feel a moment of fear or, or doubt or, you know, like, am I doing the right thing? Am I saying too much? Or am I not saying enough? The truth is everybody has hardships in their life behind every home and under every roof. There's someone struggling and they will benefit from your story and everything you have to say. And you're a beautiful soul and your story should be shared. And it, it's- Thank you. Well, now I'm committed to next fall, it's gonna be out. So, <laughs> but yeah, thank you for saying that though. That means a lot coming from you. I'm gonna door dash you a lot of coffee. <laughs> I know, right? I'm gonna like, how does this work? Susie, how do you stay up writing with the deadline? I'm gonna put some no-dos in that little hole where I put a present by your house. <laughs> I know. We have this little gift exchange where we like she drops off little secret packages and I know where to find them. It's like the best thing. Oh, I'm gonna be a bottle of no-dos in there. I'll be like, we're <laughs> I love it. Oh, my friend, I love you. I'm gonna say that publicly. Yes. Um, I am. I'm so grateful for your time today. So much fun. I hope people found it informational. I'll be sure and share links to your products. And um, I know we'll talk again soon. Maybe we'll do this again soon. But thank you all for listening and joining in on girlfriends kind of having coffee. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.